And today's date is 23 February 2023 and I am in Arlington, Virginia and I've got the pleasure of speaking with Harold Shrewsbury. Correct. Got it right. Okay. Thank you, sir, for sitting down and talking to us. Um, if you could just give us a little bit of background on yourself. Uh, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Uh, graduate high school, that kind of thing. I was born in a little town called Odd, O-D-D, West Virginia. Okay. I was born in 1948. Started out in elementary school for, had one room, one teacher taught eight grades. My dad was a coal miner okay. and we lived on a farm. Spent most of my years in school also working on the farm. We worked with horses. We didn't have a tractor. So when I was 17 and a half, I graduated from high school and I elected to join the Army okay. because I didn't want to shovel coal in a coal mine and I didn't want to cut timber. Uh, did you have any other members of your family that were military? My dad served in World War II. Okay. My grandfather served in World War I. He was wounded in World War I. Okay. My great-grandfather served in the Civil War with the Matoka National Guard. Gotcha. Okay. So you have a, you have a history, family history of service. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> my oldest son served in the Army, Harold Jr. Okay. My daughter served in the Army, Diana. And my youngest son, Joseph, served in the Army. Okay. What, why Army? Why did you choose the Army? My grandfather uh, had quite a few stories. He lost one lung from mustard gas in World War I. So I spent a lot of time. We lived close by. And I have an uncle. He and I were both born in 1948. So we grew up like brothers. So spent a lot of time with Grandpa. And then my dad talked about his wartime experience. So I decided that... Uh, since I wasn't a scholar out of high school, that uh, the Army was a good, good place to go, rather than to live in the mountains and be very unhealthy from working in a coal mine when you're 45 years old. Yeah. Uh, what, um, what conflicts and wars did you serve in? I served in, uh, along the DMZ in Korea. Okay. I served in Vietnam. I served uh, sometime in Panama right before the deployment staging uh, an artillery battalion prepared for uh, combat in uh, Panama and I served in Desert Storm. Okay. So you didn't serve during the Korean War but we were still technically, I don't know how, how they kind of classify it, you're still still at war with Korea, we're just, the shooting is, is on pause for now, I guess is how they classify it. Yeah, our mission was to defend the Imjin River in case the North Koreans came across. Okay. So we're up there in defense of uh, South Korea. Okay. Um, what, so where was your basic training? I went to basic training at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Okay. I went to AIT at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Did you have any idea what, what exactly you wanted to do in the Army, or were you just kind of leaving it up to, to the Army to tell you what you were going to do? <laughs> When I went and joined the Army, the guy's name was Master Sergeant Manning. He was the recruiter. Okay. I told him I wanted to be an electrician. So he said, I got a good job for you. You'll be a field wireman, okay. which is laying combo line. <clears throat> and apparently he was right because there is electricity that runs through that line when you crank the phone. Okay. Uh, and then I branch transferred later to field artillery. And also, I did uh, some infantry time as a drill sergeant right. and a little bit in Vietnam. Okay. So from basic training, where, where do they send you? After, after you're done with all your training, where's your first assignment? I went to uh, Bad Kreuznach, Germany okay. with the 62nd Medical Group, and I worked in the S3 shop. Gotcha. When did you go to Korea? I went to Korea in uh, August 1969. I was there 13 months. Right. Any incidents that stand out about your time there? Anything that good or bad? 
Well, being up along the DNC, uh, we could not go off post in civilian clothes. So any time you went off post, you had to be in military clothing. Okay. The last six months I was there, hostilities were pretty tense between North and South. So we had to carry a weapon and 100 rounds of ammunition wherever we went. Traveling to a place called Camp Santa Barbara to do service for him was pretty intense. I did go on one detail up in, along the DMZ, okay. and uh, that was pretty intense, especially going across the uh, Freedom Bridge. Yeah. yeah. Um, when, do, when do you make it to Vietnam? I made it to Vietnam in uh, March 1972. Okay. It was. Right at the end of the war, I should have went in February, but because of the ceasefire uh, talks, they held us up in Oakland for about three weeks before we got clearance to go into Vietnam. What, what were you, what was your duty, what was your MOS when you were in Vietnam? In Vietnam, when I got there, since I'd been a drill sergeant, they assigned me to the 1st Cav uh, combat training team and I was teaching uh, landmine warfare, repelling, and basic combat skills. But I wasn't there for about two weeks, and the artillery had requisitioned me in the 1st Battalion, 21st Field Artillery. They found out uh, the school had, com had commandeered me. So one day I was teaching the class, the next day I'm on the Huey flying to a far base. What are your first impressions when you get to Vietnam? Sure, you heard lots of things about it before you went. Yeah, I I landed in Tonsonut, and everybody goes to the replacement battalion. Okay. And we had just gotten there. They put us in a big room, and there must have been 20 of us in, in beds. The sirens went off, and rockets were coming in. And some staff sergeant told everybody to run out of the building. And I was a staff sergeant. I thought he was part of the cadre there. When I walked out the door, all 20 of them had huddled behind a pro big old propane tank. And I said, uh, I'm not going to go there. So I did what they taught us to do. I went and got under my cot, put a mattress on top of me, and come find out that guy was some mechanic. He wasn't even part of the cadre. And then the cadre come by and said, you don't want to done it right. And I said, well, I've always followed what I've told to do because I figured you know best. What were your duties in Vietnam? I was a liaison sergeant and a forward observer, and I was assigned to the 1st of the Cav, 1st Battalion, 12th Cavalry, and then the 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry, Gary Owen. My job was to prepare artillery fires, mm -hmm. prepare targets, engage the targets, and also I was in charge of the mortar platoons on each fire base. So I trained them and showed them how to operate uh, the optics and how to uh, prepare the firing data for the missions. So I spent uh, a lot of time on the fire base in those about six months uh, defending uh, uh, the area around Benoit Air Base. Okay. Any incidents stand out about your time there in Vietnam? In the first cab, there was one incident. My uh, boss was a captain. He was a fire support officer. He and the battalion commander had flown off to a meeting. And the major, who was the S3 of the battalion, this is the first of the 12th, we received the emergency mission. The Rangers had deployed and had gotten into uh, intense combat. So they were pulling them out. So I had to fly in the helicopter and adjust the artillery for the extraction fires. While we're up there, uh, I was looking for where the rounds were landing and the helicopter banked a little bit. I went to lean out the helicopter to see where the rounds were falling and the chair wasn't bolted down so I started going out of the chopper and the major saw me and grabbed the back of the chair and pulled me back in. It didn't bother me until I got on the ground. Then it kind of shook me up a little bit. Right, right. Uh, 
what are the what are the duties of a, a forward air con, or forward controller? Um, what, what are you doing? You're calling in positions for the artillery fire, or well, as a forward observer, you're working with the infantry. Okay. You prepare their defensive fires in case you get attacked. Also, uh, when you get into contact, you actually call in the artillery on the target. And as a liaison, you're working at the battalion with the S3, and you're preparing the defensive fires or counterattack fires for the battalion. So I'm in constant contact with the uh, battalion S3 of the maneuver battalion and stay in constant contact with the field artillery battalion providing the fires. Also, in my area of operation, I'm the one that cleared all uh, indirect fires landing inside my operation to ensure we didn't have a friendly fire incident. Right. So I knew where all the friendlies were located. And so when someone asked to fire my area, I would check to make sure it was okay and then give them my name and initials. My initials are Hotel Sierra, but we had a little joke there. I, mine was horse shit. <laughs> so when I said horse shit, they knew it was clear, which came to be a, a little joke later on in my life. Right. right. So that's quite a bit of responsibility then. You've got a lot of people's lives in your hands. You know, if, you, if you're making sure everything is clear and there's going to be no friendlies that get, get injured by our own artillery. Yeah, and I'm on the phone uh, all day or all night because we work 12-hour shifts. Right. And uh, I'm always listening on the radio as the maneuver units, either a platoon, company, or squad, or the ranger detachment mm -hmm. are calling in my, their location so I could plot them on the map and make sure we knew where they were so we wouldn't have an airstrike or indirect fire going into the area. Okay. Uh, are you doing, is it every day? You're working every day 12 hours? 12 you work every day 12 hours or more. Okay. And what, what are you doing when you're not working? Are you just resting up for the next day or is there any kind of downtime where you do, you know, any recreation or anything? Yeah, we had a volleyball net. Sometimes you can play, but most of the time you're pretty exhausted after, you know, 12 hour shift because on Sunday in my shift, I work 24 hours. So you work 24 hours and then the next Sunday, the other guy works 24 hours to break up the 12 hour shift. So you're either working from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. or you're working from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And, uh, it, 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 late at night in the top tactical operations center, it gets a little quiet, and we'd play pinochle, or we'd play cribbage, and the radio's right there. And something happened, you get off off of the cribbage table and right. go answer the radio. Right. And they would fly out to a stake every now and then, and occasionally they'd fly out beer, and we always got blue ribbon, black label, paps, and slits. Um, it, it's no, it's, the Vietnam War was not popular at that time. There was a lot of protesting going on in the States. Were you guys aware of that, uh, what was going on over here? And did it have any kind of effect on you one way or another? Or were you just kind of focused on the job and, you know, forget about what's going on? I kind of had an awareness of what going on, but it wasn't at that time directly influencing me uh, because I went to Germany and I spent like 19 months in Germany and then my unit reforged to Fort Lewis, Washington. Then I spent uh, about 13 months there. Then I went to Korea. And then after Korea, I went to Fort Campbell, Kentucky and I was a drill sergeant. So I was very intensely involved training soldiers to get ready for Vietnam. And I wasn't uh, that aware of what really was going on. Uh, I knew it was happening. Uh, not until I come back from Vietnam, when you notice when you get on the airplane, you're the last one to get served because at that time you had to fly in military uniform when you're on duty, moving or going on leave. So you kind of see that you're treated a little different 
There were a few patriots that come up and thank you, but most of the time it was pretty solid. I never had an incident where anybody spit at me or anything like that. But once you now look back on it, you can see there was things happening that either I wasn't aware of or I pay attention to. I was just basically being a soldier and serving my country. So prior to Vietnam, you were a drill instructor and, yes. and you were training soldiers that would eventually go to Vietnam. And then after I got to Vietnam, there was a few that I trained right. that I served with, yes. Okay, I see. Uh, these are some are these are draftees, I'm assuming, and some were volunteering? When I first got there in uh, 1970, we all, we had draftees okay. and a company at that time would have like 240. I had a platoon of 40 to 50 that I trained. Mm -hmm. So we had a mixture between National Guard, Reserve, okay. Active, and some of them were, a lot of them were draftees, yes. Uh, at the end, they stopped the draft. And I think it was 1971. So we ended up with a, uh, a group of only about 69 that were volunteers. And to be honest with you, probably half of those should have never been in the Army. They were overweight or not physically fit or mentally prepared to serve. So trying to force the volunteer Army on, we, we did some short changes. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any, did you just find there was any issues training the, the people that were, were um that had been drafted that weren't necessarily thrilled to be there? Um, were there any obstacles you had to, to, to overcome? Look, when you're a drill sergeant, as soon as they step on that bus, off of that bus, you start mentally preparing them to be a warrior. So we put a lot of fear into them. At that time, being a drill sergeant was a little bit more liberal than it is today, not to say it was right, but we trained hard. Yeah. So they didn't have time to think about whether they were drafted or whether they were a volunteer. Uh, and it didn't matter to me. I was training them to be the best soldier they could to go fight for the country and come home alive. Um, so you got over to Vietnam and you said you actually served with some of those that you had trained? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've run into two or three of them. Okay, what was that like? Like you said, you were hard on them. They, they, uh, each they, one of them come up to me yeah. and said, you trained us hard, and I really appreciate it because you're right. you got to be physically and mentally prepared to face these struggles. And they appreciated me. Yeah. I was hard, but I was fair. And uh, I wanted them to train to survive. And all three of them, I think it was three or four I met, none of them got killed that I know of. So that makes me proud. Yeah. Okay. Uh, where do you go when you get back from Vietnam? I, I, let me step back for a minute. Had you decided when you entered uh, the Army, when you enlisted, that you were going to make a career out of it, or was that something that you decided later on? That's something I decided a little later on. Okay. Uh, I see nothing looking forward to. Going back to West Virginia, yeah. I kind of liked the Army, so I re-enlisted. Uh, when I come back from Vietnam, I was assigned to the 1st Infantry Division at Fort Riley, Kansas. I noticed they had drill sergeants and had a thing called the United States Army Retraining Brigade. It was a prison. So I liked the idea of getting that $75 extra a month. So since I was drill site qualified, I went down and interviewed, and they accepted me. So I was transferred to the United States Army Retraining Brigade. Okay. Let me put it to you this way. It's the only place in the world where you took confined prisoners to the rifle range and give them loaded guns, and the cadre didn't have loaded guns on them. Wow. Quite an experience. Yeah. These guys that were there, what were they in prison for? Many different there, things. Okay. Uh, at that time, if you got court-martialed and you got sentenced and you had less than six months, you didn't go to Leavenworth. You went to the United States Army Training Brigade. 
And our mission was to basically put them through basic training with a lot of other support training. A lot of that was taught by, uh, called the Seven Steps Program, talked to by, by prisoners. Okay. If some of them had been to Leavenworth, and we'd get four or five every cycle, and they had done good at Leavenworth, they would come to us to be retrained and go to back to active duty. Okay. I'll be honest with you, I think we only had about a five to ten percent success rate. Okay. That would go that made it through and then would go back to basic? Or one I had come through three times. Okay. The army just wasn't discharging people at yeah. the time. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, where do you go from there? I went to Germany. With the First Armored Division and uh, First and Ninth Fourth Field Artillery, that was in 1975, and I spent three years there. And this is tanks. What kind of armor was it? Was it the First Armored Division? Okay. Is they call it armor because the primary three brigades, and you have two brigades right. with two battalions of armor and one battalion of infantry. Then you got one brigade with uh, one armored and two mechanized infantry. And being an eight inch, we're general support fires for the division. I see. I see. And your, your mission while you're there is to prepare for a Soviet invasion? Of Correct. East Germany, essentially? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to be honest with you, straightforward right now. We didn't have any money. I don't think we're going to fall our way out of a paper sack. We had vehicles that we couldn't get parts for, so we cannibalized from one to the other. The primary thing was to keep those howitzers and the ammo carriers and the fuel tankers prepared. We'd go on a 30-day training exercise and have 500 rounds to shoot. And we'd spend 25 to 30 days at a place called Grafenbeer doing service fires and doing training. Money was just not there. The caliber of soldiers was not there. They had a program for people that uh, had been on drugs called CDAC. Now, if a soldier, if you come in late, you might get a hand spanking. But if you're a section chief and one of your soldiers missed his CDAC appointment, you'd get slammed and dunked. We had a lot of emphasis on rehabilitation, not on training. I, it was just a poor army at the time, and I can't say it any better. Yeah. yeah. How, how real in your in your mind was the threat that the Soviets were going to invade? I mean, you guys were tip of the spear, really. I think the threat was uh, because you got the Warsaw Pact, right. and our mission is to. Uh, provide defense of the Fulda Gap. And that's where the Warsaw Pact, we assume, would attack through. Yeah. And we spent a lot of time, what we call GDP, preparing our positions up there. We didn't th do anything to harden them, but we already had surveys and we had firing points to go to and move in. We were a nuclear delivery, deliverable uh, artillery unit, so we spent a lot of time uh, training how to prepare the rounds, training how to transport the rounds, and uh, and really how to engage with a nuclear war. The threat was very, very strong. Yeah. yeah. So these are what they call tactical nukes or? Tactical nukes, tactical. yeah. And they are fired from the artillery piece? Yes. You have them both in the 8 inch and the 155. Okay. What's the range of something like that? You're, you're getting ready to deliver a nuclear weapon. You want to be as far away as you can be, I'm assuming, <laughs> when it lands. I will tell you that at that time, the 8-inch howitzer had a range of 14,800 meters. Okay. I'm not going to tell you the range of the nuke round. Yeah. Okay. It's still too sensitive to tell you. Gotcha. And is that, is that something that's similar to a regular artillery round as far as how, it, how it's fired? Or is these it's totally special, specialized equipment? Very specialized. Okay. Okay. It takes, and I'm going to tell you how long, it takes time to put one together. I got you. Now, we had a, a round called a spotter round. 
that's supposed to be uh, ballistically the same as the nuclear realm. And so as a forward observer, which I spent a lot of time doing, you would follow those uh, and kind of like practicing to follow a nuclear realm. That's similar characteristics, I guess? It, it did, yeah. yeah. Okay. But remember, you're not going to stand up on an observation post when you go into far for effect with a new ground. Right. You're going to fire the spot around, then you can get the hell out of town. <laughs> gotcha. You're right. You're right. How long were you in Germany? That time, uh, 37 months. Okay. Um, good, that was a good assignment, I'm assuming? It was a good assignment. I ended up as a sergeant first class there and end up being the first sergeant E8 position of headquarters battery. Are you, are you married at the time? Yes. You are? Is your, is your wife able to come with you? Is this yes. a company tour? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Were you married You married prior to or after Vietnam? Prior. Uh, no, after Vietnam. After Vietnam. Yeah. So you got, but between the time you went to Germany and Vietnam, you got married? Yeah, at Fort Riley, Kansas. Yeah. I got you. Okay. And had, I had a son that I took with us. He was only like four or five months old. Then my daughter was born there. Where do you go from Germany? I went to uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, another 8 inch battalion, and I was the first sergeant of headquarters battery. And at some point, you would end up in Panama? Well, that's a little later. We're, we're, yeah. I left Fort Sill and went back to Germany okay. in uh, 2nd Battalion, 78th Field Artillery. And a guy you know named Tommy Franks was a battalion commander. Yeah. And we were in Bamberg. And that was a 155 battalion. Okay. So I spent another 36 months in, uh, in Germany. Okay. Same, same mission? Same mission, same, same division. Yeah. You. I see. Okay. Then I left there and I went to Fort Polk, Louisiana with the 5th Infantry Division. And I was the first sergeant of a howitzer battery, 155. And then I made E9, and I become the operations sergeant major for division artillery. Okay. I left there, and I went to El Paso, Texas, and went to the sergeant major's academy. I left there, went to Fort Ord, California, and I was a battalion sergeant major, the second of the eighth field artillery. And then I became the Division Artillery Sergeant Major, and that's when uh, Division Commander and I deployed a battalion to Panama, and then we went down and helped them prepare for the invasion. Okay. okay. Uh, so you were in actually in Panama? Yes. Yeah. 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 I wasn't there during the conflict. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and then eventually Desert Storm? I left there. And I was assigned as the community sergeant major in Ansbach, Germany, with the 1st Armored Division. And I had been pre-selected to be the command sergeant major of 7th Corps Artillery. Okay. Uh, the gentleman who held that job were getting close to 30 years. So I helped the 1st Armored Division headquarters and uh, the associate units deploy out of Germany. And then I joined 7th Corps Artillery in Saudi Arabia in January 91. Okay. Is that three tours or four in Germany? Four tours four in tours. Germany. Okay. So now you're with 7th Corps? Yes. And you're, you're deployed to Saudi Arabia. This is after the invasion of Kuwait? No, no. Before? Before. Long before. Yeah, long before. Are you in Saudi Arabia during that, during, when Saddam invades Kuwait? Kopchi? Yeah. Yes, I was in, actually I was in, uh, just got to a place uh, called Daharan okay. and then uh, deployed up to our forward position. It just happened when Kopchi happened. Gotcha. Um, what are your thoughts when you hear about, about the invasion that Saddam had come down into Kuwait and was now threatening Saudi Arabia? Why, when I got to Dahran, uh, being a command sergeant major, you get a little special treatment. 
So I had somebody to pick me up, take me over to a place to stay until uh, I got on the C-130 the next day. That night we had a scud attack. So that was scary uh, for my soldiers. Even though we could shoot it down, the round hit the few lots, not the warhead. So you got the first intense of being in a combat zone and very fearful for the troops on the ground knowing the scuds were coming. When Saddam attacked, I took it as just a fence op operation trying to test out what our defenses were. I don't, I don't think he was trying to do a major invasion. He was trying to find out if we were for real or not. Yeah. And the Marines stuck that battle on pretty well. Yeah. I guess he found out. <laughs> he did. We he, were for real. He, we, he did. So what happens after the invasion? Um, what's going on now? Um, you know, President Bush is, is telling him, you got to get out, we're coming over. What are you guys doing? Are you preparing for, for, for what would eventually be Desert Storm? We were training. We were, remember, we deployed out of Germany. Different geographical area. Uh, matter of fact, I went on a recon one day, not long after I got there, and I found out that the powder we had for our 155s were predominantly green bag. Now, green bag is charges one through five. That's okay in Germany because the battle's a little closer. In the desert, you need more white bag, which is charges six for seven. The different colors means the round goes further. So we had to get emergency resupply of powder to get the right mixture of powder. Okay. Because we pulled stuff out of our logistics points. Uh, we trained. We trained how to fight in a wedge. The artillery, how to disperse because we thought he had a pretty good counterfire battery uh, capability. So we trained putting the howitzers further apart to keep from getting annihilated from a few rounds landing into the battery. Uh, a lot of navigation training also. Yeah, yeah. So we actually put boat compasses on the vehicles. Really? Yeah to navigate with yeah. us before we got the GPS. Yeah. G GPS came probably a week or 10 days before the invasion. Okay. So the Army had, had prepared for what would they thought would be a war with the Soviets. Um, and now we're in a desert conflict. What kind of challenges is that you guys face for trying to prepare for a different, a different kind of conflict? than you thought you were going to have to. Well, let me go back and say that I told you in the early 70s, mid-70s, we were not very well prepared. Right. 1981 come along, we started focusing on training quality soldiers to get rid of the riffraff that floated into the Army. Right. Recruiting efforts really went up, so we started getting a lot of talent. President Reagan started putting a lot of money back into the military. In uh, 2nd 78th Field Artillery in Bamberg, we got more spare parts, more supplies, uh, living conditions in the barracks were changing, training become more intensive. So we were really, really training hard, and we were really fit to fight. I mean, that was, to me, a dramatic change from say 75, six years later to 81, and how we slowly built the army back up. We were, we were ready to take on the Russians. The Russians really didn't know what they were going to face with the caliber of people we have. Right. Now, we kind of thought the T-72 tank was pretty superior tank. After we got involved with Iraqis, it was more of a paper tiger than what it was. Because remember, we were hitting targets at 
3,700 meters, and their max range is like 2,600 meters. Our kill ratio is one to one. We see it hit you. Theirs are like two to three to one. Okay. And we could outmaneuver them. The Abrams tank just could really annihilate them. Uh, the other thing is that the tactical move the Seven Corps made by moving west and coming around with the hook through Sadamov. We had knocked out his communications. We had been doing FENT operations. I tell you, on the 21st of February, 1991, I seen a, a witness a spectacular event. Now, in core artillery, we had five brigades of artillery. We had five divisions, and each one of them had a brigade. Then we had some separate organizations. We had what we call a time on target, where everybody shoots at their target, and all the rounds land at the same time. Okay. You're talking about a huge core artillery doing this. I had never seen a battery be able to do it totally effective. The reason is we had GPS, which is real time. There's more, no more synchronize your watch. Right. Everybody was on the same time. I stood on the berm between Saudi Arabia and Iraq with my binoculars, and I watched artillery pieces and rockets come from nowhere. They laid at the right time. They started shooting, and then all the rounds were impacting. Each MLRS fired one pod, each howitzer fired five rounds, and light travels faster. So you'd see the flash, and then you'd hear the bang, and it was like an echo. Boom, 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 because closer pieces, yeah. you know, uh, sound would get there easier. And you look way overhead, we had rocket assisted projectiles, and you'd see the rockets kick off overhead. A phenomenal event. So we were prepared, and then some, for that conflict. Our soldiers were prepared. Yeah. Our soldiers were trained. We had the right equipment. We had the right commanders on the ground. Yeah. And we had the largest, largest armored corps ever formed in the United States, or the world, probably. Yeah. I imagine there a, were a lot of uh, soldiers then that had never seen combat. Um, and, and probably relied heavily on guys like you that had been in Vietnam and, had, you know, you, already, you had already seasoned veteran um, to kind of give them the lay of the land, hey, what, this is what to expect, that kind of thing. Two things. One is preparing defensive positions. A little thing like knowing how to fill the sandbag. Right. Because they, they never really had to deal with them before. And your experience you had, like in Vietnam, Panama, other places give you a leg up to teach the soldiers how to build bunkers, how to fill sandbags. You, you don't fill them to where they're round because they won't stack. Right. And how to take a two before or a pickaxe, kind of flatten them out a little bit and uh, make it like a brick wall. How to put the right overhead on. I remember going to one battalion and it dug a hole in the ground and put plywood on top of it, put big rocks on it. So the lieutenant came over and I said, none of my soldiers will get in that hole. And he said, why? And I said, have you ever been on the receiving end of a 130 millimeter gun? He said, no. I said, I have. If that thing hits, that round stands about that height. And vibration will knock them rocks, break that wood, and you, you'll kill people in that bunker. You're trying to save them, not kill them. Right. So it was that kind of experience that you had. Because I was in Vietnam, I left the 1st Cav and I went to MACV as an artillery advisor. And I was up in Hue. Every day, the NVA would fire five 130 millimeter rounds into Hue, trying to blow up the, the core headquarters of the 1st uh, uh, of the Arvin. Right. And one of my jobs was to go do a shell rip where those rounds landed, trying to get the direction the round come from. Then we had radar operating. Uh, later on, as a staff sergeant, I become the radar detachment first sergeant in Vietnam. I was only like 23 years old. But we would have gauge points, like three shell reps, 
one radar, one radar, and then we'd have the Air Force to fly over and bomb where we thought the, the artillery pieces were. So every day, it never stopped, five rounds, and it'd be sometime between 1 p.m., 3 p.m. during siesta. One day, one of the rounds landed in way in the market area, and it was horrific of all the casualties that were there. What, um, so, th so your training during the lead up to the ground war, um, how much notice did you get between, how much notice did you get that the ground war was going to kick off? Kind of a loaded question. It depends on what level of authority you were in yeah. with the notification. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was supposed to be on the 17th of February. Then it was kicked up to the 22nd, if I remember correctly. Uh, no, the 23rd, today. Uh, I knew about 24 hours before that it was a definite go. And the soldiers knew shortly after that. Okay, so they were they were on on they were told to be ready on a moment's notice, kind of yes. thing. I mean, yes. Okay, so they didn't they had no idea when it was coming for weeks. Yeah, it's kind of like scuttlebutt. It's going right. to be next week or the week right. after. Yeah. Gotcha. But the political thing was going on, trying to keep it from happening. Yeah. And then uh, the air force was bombing and trying to get them to. Uh, cease and exist, but right. it politically it didn't work out. It didn't work out, yeah. What, uh, what are your duties during this time? I was, you're pretty high up now. You're E9. Um, I'm the Corps Artillery Sergeant Major, okay. and I was the Corps Artillery Commander, General Craig Neighbors, eyes and ears on the ground. Okay. I visited every battalion as often as I could. I spent a lot of time in my Humvee driving all over the battlefield. Gotcha both in Saudi Arabia and Iraq. One time, I'd been up into Iraq, and I was relying on the GPS, and we didn't have the map sheet for that Pacific area, so me and my driver ended up in a minefield. So I'm looking around, and I'm saying, one, how did I get here? And number two, how the hell are we going to get out of here? So I got to thinking and put my military mind together, and I said, they had soldiers in here. They had to get resupplied. So there had to be lanes for them to drive through to be able to get the supplies. So you put on your old Vietnam sixth sense thinking, and I kind of kneeled down in the sand, and I saw little mounds of sand about 10 foot apart with and they're kind of in line and i said ah so we kind of stayed in that lane and we got through one in investment and i said oh my gosh thank god we're through we hit another one so we went through three and right before the end of the third one i told my driver to stop we almost hit a mine and uh, we backed up and got out of there my fault. Then another time we were out there driving around on a, a dirt road and we get to the MSR and it was blocked. So we had to make a right. There was a big wooden sign there and we had to go down through a wide end back up on the road. We looked at the sign that says do not travel, road mine. So my driver said what we're going to do? I said, don't even think about it. We didn't hit one. We're safe. Just thank God. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, what are your duties once the war kicks off, the ground war? Um, well, I elected to fly in the Huey with General Abrams to oversee the fires of uh, the Corps artillery. If I'd have been on the ground, I'd have been a nuisance to some battalion commander. So it's better for me to be up in the command and control chopper. And then my driver took my Humvee through and then meet us strategically at some point. Uh, on the second day of the war, General Abrams and I are flying in a Huey to go look at 
I think it was second uh, cavalry division. And the, we're flying about 50 feet off the ground. The pilot comes on and says, we have just been locked in by our radar. And then a few seconds later, and he dropped down to about five feet off the ground, which is very dangerous. He said, we've just been engaged. So I said a prayer real quick, and I'm looking out the, toward the rear of the helicopter, and General Abrams says, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to watch this missile fly at my ass. What else am I going to do? But it, it didn't hit us. We landed. We uh, was there where we were interrogating a few prisoners. We got back on the chopper. As we were flying back, we saw some fuel tankers. And when you're in the chopper, you don't fly over a fuel tanker. So we landed to get fuel, and they were preparing to move. So our crew chief asked them why they were moving. And the guy said, well, a helicopter flew here by a while ago and a, uh, had an explosion not too far behind it. Uh, and that was that missile they right. shot at us. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, what were some of the challenges uh, that you saw uh, that needed to be overcome, especially during the ground war? You know, the ground war went very effective. Uh, one of the things that really helped is because we had suppressed their communications capability and their communications intel capability. General Franks made a decision not to change frequencies or change call signs every 24 hours or if you've been compromised. That kept communications open. You wasn't fumbling around trying to find your new uh, signal. You wasn't trying to uh, frequency to be on. You wasn't trying to find a new call sign. You wasn't trying to find a new password. I thought that was a, a good call, based tactically how the situation was on the ground. Uh, I'm so impressed with how soldiers performed. Someone asked me one time, how did the female soldiers do? And I said, most of them did pretty well. A few of them had trouble. And you know what? Most of the male soldiers did well, and a few of them had trouble. I hate that disparity between soldiers. Right. When you're a soldier, you're a soldier. Yeah. And if you don't train everybody equally, you're training for failure. Yeah. And treat them equally. Right. Um, I, I, this, is not a, this is a dumb question because you're here for a reunion, but you keep in, you keep in touch with the people you serve with, I'm assuming? I keep in touch with I'm the treasurer association. I've been involved in this association since the beginning. Yeah. And I'm the golf champion, so I schedule the annual golf tournament and do the fundraising. And I've been the vice president of the organization. Unfortunately, most of them are the higher ranking people that come to these reunions. On our 25th, we did have quite a few new people to come. Uh, Supporting the scholarship fund is very, very important to me. And I'm a big factor in the fundraiser for that. Last year, uh, our golf tournament raised over $20,000. And uh, that goes back to the soldiers and their family. We're down into grandchildren now giving scholarships. Yeah. And it's all done in honor of the 111 that didn't make it. If you want to know more about what I observed during Desert Storm, I wrote an article called On to War. It was published in, uh, I think it was December 1991 in the Field Artillery Journal. And it covers for me uh, preparing the 1st Armored Division, leaving, setting up family support groups in the community, and throughout the war. Uh, it's a pretty good essay, so I'd recommend you read it. It's called On to War by Harold Shrewsbury. Okay. Where do you finish up your career? Well, after Desert Storm, I ended up back in Augsburg, and I was the co artillery sergeant major plus the community sergeant major of Ansbach. General Franks. Had, was a brigadier general then. 
I had run into him uh, in Desert Storm. He was the ADCM of First Cavalry Division. And he got reassigned to be the uh, assistant commander at Fort Sill. The Field Artillery NCO Academy had failed its accreditation. So he got a hold of the Sergeant Major, he called me and said, I need you to come here, I need help. So I left Germany and I went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and I become the Commandant of the Field Artillery Non-Commissioned Officer Academy. I had uh, the Advanced Non-Commissioned non Officer course, I had the Basic Non-Commissioned Officer course, and I had, at that time called the Primary Leadership Development course. I'd have as many as 750 students at one time. In that position, as an enlisted person, you're actually a de facto battalion commander. So I had no officers. I run the whole thing. To me, that was a pity in my uh, career uh, training. Within five months after I got there, we were reaccredited and had no faults, or no deficiencies on the reinspection. I attribute a lot to that to uh, General Marty, Sergeant Major Stewart, General Franks. They gave me total support to be able to accomplish that. And we trained the whole methodology of training. And uh, being the commander, I learned that there's a distinct difference between being the senior advisor to the commander than actually the commander making the decisions. And then I was selected to work for a two-star here in Washington, D.C. And at that time it was called OPTEC, Operational Test and Evaluation Command. And uh, so we moved here to Fort Myer. And uh, I was able to get back in school and finish my degree. My wife uh, was a silver servant, and uh, she was able to work here and uh, raise my boys, and sure. then I uh, retired. Wow, outstanding. Um, how do you, were you ever uh, wounded at all in combat? Not yeah. physically. Okay. Uh, I'm a 100% disabled veteran. 80% of it is service connected, okay. uh, wartime service. In the year 2000, I developed tonsil cancer, which is from Agent Orange that I was exposed to in Vietnam and also along the DMZ, Korea. Yeah. Okay. And that almost took my life. Wow. Uh, you can see that scar where yeah. they cut me. Wow. And uh, uh, thank God uh, I was able to survive that. Uh, I was on disability from work for about 11 months, but I almost didn't make it. Wow. Uh, how do you think that you're looking back on it now, your wartime experience has, has affected you, has shaped who you are? To be uh, totally honest with you, uh, I suffer from PTSD. Thanks to the Veterans Administration, I went through a whole year of clinical training. I've learned how to cope with that, realizing it's something that never goes away, but you got to mentally cope with it. Uh, I used to have uh, a lot of bad dreams and fighting them asleep. Uh, with the help from the VA, I was able to work around those issues. It's nowhere near as severe. Uh, during Desert Storm, I had a soldier die in my arms. In Vietnam, I've seen uh, a lot of death. Uh, I've actually escorted uh, my best friend, uh, was killed in home, that was killed in Vietnam. Uh, also, we had a soldier killed in Panama. I escorted him. And uh, there's been a lot of other tragedies that's happened, whether wartime or peacetime. Yeah. To me, We've done a lot of good work in training soldiers how to survive once they be quit becoming a soldier, but that's a big challenge. It's a horrible challenge that I ended up being the Assistant Inspector General for the Federal Communications Commission, 
In the civilian uh, workforce, I was a GS-15. And I had a lot of challenges because it's a distinct difference of how you lead and manage in the Army versus on the Silver Side. I, uh, when I first got out of the Army, I worked for a telecommunications company. I built and designed wireless communication systems basically all over the United States. And then after uh, I had the cancer, the, uh, the business had kind of changed so I could no longer live in the Washington DC area and fly to market and do my work. I had to move to market. So then I got a job with the Silver Service. And uh, it was a good career, a very successful career, but a lot of challenges. Soldiers need to be trained how to tone their leadership to meet the civilian arena versus how you operate in the military. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Last question for you. If somebody sees this interview in 50 years, 100 years down the road, what advice would you send them, uh, especially someone who's considering a career in the military? Love your country. Love your service. Serve your country. I don't care who you are or what you are. My feelings are all of us need to serve a country in some capacity. It could be in the military. It could be as a civil servant. It could be as a volunteer. But we owe our country that. And our country owes us something back. And I think education is the thing that they can provide. So if you would go serve your country in whatever capacity, then I think you shouldn't get paid a whole lot of money, but the reward should be an education out of that and to train you. The military is not for everybody. I'm going to tell you that right now. I, I, I've seen that as a drill sergeant. I've seen it as a leader. I've seen it as working in the United States Army with Training Brigade. It's not for everybody. And I'll give you an example. I, when I was in Germany in the 2nd and 78th Field Artillery, I had a really rogue soldier. And I finally had him put out of the Army. The day before he left, I called him in my office, and I gave him a letter of appreciation. I said, you are the best pool player I've ever seen. Do you know that soldier almost cried in front of me because I found out no one had ever told him he'd ever done anything good. And that made me feel proud. Even though he didn't fit as a soldier, I was able to recognize something good he could do. Yeah. And uh, I'm hope that that carried on. Like I said, the military's not for everybody. And it shouldn't be. When my youngest son was joining the Army, the only thing I asked was to talk to the recruiter. So the recruiter came to my house and I sat Joseph down and him down. And I said, Joseph, I'm your dad. I served in the Army 30 years. You're getting ready to join the Army. This is not the Cub Scouts. This is not the Boy Scouts. This is not the high school football team. You don't quit. Because see, if you quit this, you're going to have a very tough future ahead of you with a bad discharge. So are you committed to do this? And he said, yes. I said, fine. I said, second of all, if you ask to deploy, you better get your ass on that plane because if you don't, I'm going to throw your ass on that plane because that's why you joined. Yeah. And he did. He joined uh, the reserves. He volunteered to be deployed. He went to Kuwait as an MP, and he was escorting VIPs from Kuwait into Baghdad. And it really, uh, he really thanked me for what I said, because it's a different institute. You, you, you got to be committed. And if you're not able to commit yourself totally, then you should stay away. And the rewards are great. Look, a hillbilly kid probably graduated from high school with a D average. I finished college, 1975, 4.0, straight A's. Time, maturity, cured a lot of that.
Well, on behalf of the Americans of Wartime Experience, thank you, sir, for sitting down and talking to us. And uh, I really appreciate that. And I thank you very much for your service, 30 years plus to the United States. Well, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm.